Alrighty, so hi everyone. Thank you for coming to today's webinar. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, please feel free to ask questions in the chat and um, our presenter will answer them as we go through the presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and kick things off with a quick intro about our presenter. Um, so Dr. Rian Shu is an applied statistician and assistant professor in the Department of Allied Health Sciences. His method methodological research interests include general quantitative methods such as causal inference methods, econometrics, and applied machine learning. System science approaches as well, such as social network analysis, agent-based modeling, and system dynamics modeling. He has developed new statistical and simulation models for longitudinal analysis, contagion effects in social networks, and implementation science within the organizational context. He also has a bright substantive research interest in social media and health, such as the spread of health misinformation, e-health communication, and how social networks mediate interventions delivered by social media to affect various health outcomes. Everybody, please give a welcome to Dr. Ranchu. All right. Thanks, Matt, for the nice introduction. And uh, welcome, everyone, to this workshop. Glad to have you all here. And so today's workshop is about the uh, introduction to social network analysis in mHealth and social media research. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so agenda for today is first we'll talk a little bit about some motivation and background for social network analysis. And then we'll introduce some fundamentals or the basic languages in SNA or social network analysis so that everyone's on the same page. Then we'll cover some common measures you know, of the no characteristics in SNA, or some common measures for narrow characteristics in SNA. And social network analysis is also about the set of theories, so we'll cover some of that as well. And finally, if we have time, we'll cover some issues in network visualization and give you some real world examples of how SNA can be used in uh, M health and social media research. Yeah, I, I probably have prepared more materials than what we can cover in one hour, so we'll see where we land at the end. And what I'll do is that, uh, like Matt said, uh, after each section, I will stop and uh, for questions. And just feel free to type your questions in the chat box as we go. And uh, so I'll stop after each section to read through them. All right, here we go. So first, motivation and background. So what is SNA or social network analysis? So SNA is a set of methods and tools for systematically understanding and uncovering the patterns of connection among actors. So it is both a set of theories and a set of methods. So it is a set of series which we can use to explain how networks relate to various outcomes that we are interested in, and also explain the emergence or change of social network structures. And it is also a set of statistical methods that we can use to characterize the property of networks, a model how networks relate to behavior or social outcomes, or a model how the structure of networks change over time. And uh, SNA has always been interdisciplinary. Uh, historically, it has its roots in sociology, anthropology, math, and physics. And now the border between disciplines has been less and less clear and become, it's becoming more interdisciplinary and widely used in fields such as social and behavior science, linguistics, communication, computer science, biology, and many others. All right, so why? So why do we care or why do we want to use SNA in social media and health research? First is that the social networks is ubiquitous in social media research. Just considering that the social interaction and the connectedness is the fundamental building block of social media. So it's only natural that we use social network analysis to study social networks. And second is because the social networks relate to many outcomes and phenomena that we're interested in, such as the diffusion of health information or rumor. So one of the more recent example is that Ahmed studied the rumor of uh, the rumor that there's a relationship between 5G and COVID and how that spread on Twitter. And uh, it also relates to uh, psychological outcomes such as happiness and well-being or changing various health behaviors such as obesity and weight loss. So again, um, it's uh, social network analysis relates to a lot of phenomena we're interested in and are widely applied or used. All right. 
Next, let's talk about some fundamentals. So we all have the same basic language to talk about social network analysis. So the building blocks of social networks consists of nodes and edges. So nodes, also known as vertices, refers to the actor in the network. And be, can be plotted as a set of points. And depending on what you are studying, it can be people, organization, words, website, etc. And then edges, um, also known as links or ties, that they represent the relationship in the network. And in the graph, it can be represented as a set of lines or arcs. Again, depending on what you're studying, it can represent friendship or a follow mentioning relationship, co-occurrence, hyperlink, et cetera, et cetera. All right, just consider this uh, relatively simple communication stream between these four people, all right? And uh, Anne said, Jim, tell the Murray they're invited. Jim said, Mary, you and your dad should come for dinner. James said, Mr. Murray, you should both come for dinner. Anne said, Mary, did James tell you about the dinner? You must come. John said, Mary, are you hungry? So as you can see, uh, although we only have four people, the communication stream is sort of relatively complex. So we can sort of simplify it a little bit and, uh, and represent that into our networks here, where each red circle represents a person. And the link represents one person has sent a text or made a communication to the other person. And immediately we can see the two kids, Jim and Mary, which are represented by the node two and three, are talk to each other. Or the two parents, Anne and John, represented by one and four. They uh, do not directly talk to each other, but they communicate with both kids. So by using uh, representing the communication stream as a network, we can immediately uh, gain a lot of insights and see what's going on here. So when you're collecting or analyzing network data, uh, there's a couple, uh, many different types of network data that you need to consider. And you need to know what types of network data you have. It can be directed versus or undirected, binary or value, one mode or two mode, egocentric or complete. Uh, and uh, when you store the network data, it can be either adjacent in matrix or edges. All right, let's go over them one by one. So first is very simple. So you first you need to consider whether the direction of the link matters. So if it, yes, then you will need a, or you will have a directed network. For example, in a following network controller, you follow me is different from I follow you. So this is evident from the upper half of the graph where the, each link has an arrow. So that means direction, direction matters. In this case, you have a directed network or directed graph. And in other cases, direction doesn't matter that much. For example, if you have a co-occurrence network, and for, uh, the network relationship represents if to two topics or two words uh, co-occur in the same document. And if that's the case, direction does not matter. Then you have a undirected graph, as we show in the bottom half of the graph. And uh, when you consider the strengths of each link or your network tie, it can be either binary or value. So, and if it's binary, that means uh, it's either one or zero, representing if there's a tie or there isn't a tie. For example, if you have a, uh, you're studying the following network on Twitter, then it should be a binary network because either someone followed the other or they don't. And this is, uh, shown by on the left part of the graph. Or sometimes if we have a more fine-grained measure of the strengths, for example, if you're studying a retweet network and uh, the uh, strength, the value can represent the number of times A has retweeted B, then you have a valued network. So as you can see for the network on the right, A has retweeted B five times and B has retweeted C three times. All right, and uh, another thing you need to consider is whether you have a one-mode network or two-mode network. So in one-mode network, there's only one type of actors in the network. Again, it can be either people, organization, websites, depending on what you're studying. But other times, when you have two types of actor in the network, then we have what they call a two-mode network or bipartite or affiliation network. For example, you can uh, the two type of actors can be people and documents or people and organizations. 
So in this example I show here on the right, where the darker node, uh, the darker green nodes uh, represents the organization, the lighter green nodes represents the people. So here, this is a two mode network representing which people belong to which organization. And so when you have a two types of, uh, of actors, sometimes we like to simplify the representation and on, by only plotting one type of actor. And this is what we call that one mode or uni, uh, unipartite uh, projection. So here in, the, in this example, you can, so from the two mode network, you can create a network where only contain organizations or a network only contain people. So in the network where only contain organizations, a link between two organizations, meaning they have the same organization members. Where in a people only network, a link between two people, meaning that they join the same organization. All right. And uh, when you design your study or collect your network data, it's important to consider whether you want a egocentric network or complete network. So in an egocentric network, network only comprise of individual respondent and the people they are connected with. And this is often used when there's no clear boundary of the system or when we cannot collect all the information of everyone in the system. And this is uh, very often seen in survey-based research. So in this example, uh, as shown in the graph here, so A and B are your uh, individual or primary respondent. So you admit a survey to A and B and ask who they're connected with or who their friends are. Then all the blue nodes, which we call, so A and B are what we call egos, and whoever they nominate is what we call authors. And in this type of a design, you have the information on the egos and their authors, but you don't know whether authors are connected with each other or who else these authors are connected with. So that was what we call the egocentric network data. And in this type of design, the questions of interest is really things such as the size of one's network or type of relations. For example, you can ask uh, what is, how many friends do A and B have and what type of relationship do they have with A and B. And uh, on the other hand, if you have all the connections among all members within a population or all data of all actors within a particular boundary, then you have what we call a complete network data as we shown on the graph on the right. For example, if you're studying a closed Facebook group and then you have all the interactions within that Facebook group, then you have a complete network data. Or in other example, let's say you're following a particular hashtag, let's say 5G and code, right? And then if you collect all the retweet and mention network following that hashtag, then you also have a complete network. All right. So that's the mo more common types of network data. So when you have to store your network data on computers, there are usually two ways you can store it. You can either store your network as an adjacency matrix or as an edge list. <laughs> So adjacency matrix is just an n by n matrix where n represents the number of actors. In this simple example, let's say A is connected to B and B is connected to C, all right? So we have three people in this network. So if you want to store the network as an adjacency matrix, you will have a three by three adjacency matrix. And uh, each cell represents whether the row actor has sent out a link to the column actor. So here, A has sent out a link to B, so this cell has a value of one. And the B has sent out a link to C, so this cell has a value of one. And all the other <coughs> cell has a value of zero, meaning there's no ties. So adjacency <coughs> matrix is the most common way we store network data. But as you can see, there are a lot of zeros, which takes a lot of computer space if you have a large network. So the alternatively, you can store your network data as an edge list. So edge list is just a list of non-zero valued interactions. So again, in this example, we only have two ties or two existing ties. So we only have two rows in the edge list. And then each column, you have the source, the target, and the value of that network. So this saves a lot of space because it get rid of uh, all the zeros. 
But one thing that we need to know is that uh, you can lose inform uh, the edge list can lose information on isolates. For example, let's say in the network you have another actor D here, all right, who is an isolate, who doesn't have any network relation with anyone else. So if you store your network as the adjacency matrix, D will still show up, shows up. But if you still uh, store the network as an edge list, then you will never see D. So that's just something to keep in mind. All right. So last slides in this section is that there's some ethical considerations when collecting network data. So obviously this is a large area, I cannot cover them all. Um, so, but, uh, and uh, most social network studies follow all the standard ethical standards for other human subjects research, but there are some unique things about social network study because compared with other studies, you need to, usually you need to collect more personalized or collect more identifying information for each person because you need to figure out who is connecting with them. So that brings some unique challenges in terms of ethical considerations. For example, in the, when you are trying to obtain in the consent form, so when you're click, uh, collecting a complete network data, for example, if you go to an organization or a company and trying to collect the complete network data in that organization, you usually provide a full roster of the organization members and ask each one to choose whoever they are connected with from the full roster. But you need to provide the members with the option to exclude themselves from the study. And when they choose to exclude themselves from the study, you also need to exclude them from the roster so that other people don't see them. And if you're just, uh, collecting egocentric network data, and uh, usually uh, we don't need consent form for those authors because they are considered secondary subjects when there's no identifying information is collected. For example, if you're asking ego who they're connected with or who their friends are, and they say, uh, Joe is my friend. And if they only provide the first name, uh, that wouldn't consider as identifying information. So you don't need the actually need the consent form from Joe. But however, if they give the uh, full name or there's more identifying information, so you actually know who Joe is, then you need to uh, obtain the consent form from Joe as well. And also you need to avoid coercion and the researchers should sol solicitate participation themselves rather than receive help from the management. And for example, if a, a manager sends out an email asking their uh, organization members to participate in the study, this sometimes can see as a coercion or a direct order, and we should avoid this. And the other, other standards for confidentiality that we should follow, for example, to have a specific data handling protocol in place, and to separate the codebook linking names to ID from the actual raw data, and you need to destroy the identifying information at the earliest possible date. And because you're collecting all this very detailed personalized information, and uh, there are also unique benefits that you can provide by doing social network study. And uh, of course, with the privacy in mind. And uh, for example, if you're providing the feedback uh, to the management, and then you can only provide the aggregate level feedback. However, you, if you're providing feedbacks to the individual participants, you can provide the more specific personalized feedback. For example, uh, how does my network compare with other people? Or what is a more personalized recommendation to improve my networks? Things like that. All right, so I don't see any questions in the chat, so now Go on. And like I said, feel free to type your questions in the chat as we move forward. And I'll stop at the end of each section and uh, try to answer some of them. But since now I see no questions, so I assume we're all good. So I just move on. All right. So next, let's talk about some common measures for node characteristics. So one of the common analysis in SNA is to characterize the difference between nodes with regard to their positions in the network, as well as the relative importance of each node, which is known as the centrality measures. And I'll just introduce some common centrality measures, which we can uh, see here. 
but uh, the reason why we want to do this is that the position for each individual matters in the network because a lot of times they have to do with uh, what they behave, how they, they behave, what they think, and their function in the network. All right. So the first centrality measure is simple. It's called in-degree centrality. So it captures the number of nodes that have links to the focal node. And uh, often used as a measure of popularity or prestige. For example, if we're studying the following relation uh, network on Twitter, so the number of followers that uh, someone has is this person's uh, in degree centrality. So the more followers I have, means more popular I am, or higher prestige I have. And for me, I have exactly three followers on Twitter. So I guess that speaks up my popularity on Twitter. And in this friendship nomination network here, uh, example here, Emma has an in degree of four because uh, Emma has received four links from Mike, Bob, Jill, and Shane. So Emma has the in degree of four. All right, so all degree centrality is the exact uh, opposite concept. So it captures the number of nodes that receive links from the focal node. And they often used as a measure of gregariousness or activeness. For example, the number of accounts someone is following is this person's L degree centrality. So the more people or more accounts you follow means more active you are or more gregarious you are. In this example, Jill has nominated four people or Jill has sent out four links. So Jill has an L degree of four. All right, yep, I'll go here. So in order to introduce the next several concepts, we first need to understand what is a network distance. So network distance is measured by the number of steps or the number of uh, network ties that separating each pair. So let's say we start from uh, actor A here, all right, down at the bottom. Then all the uh, blue nodes, including B, has a network distance of one to A. And all the lighter, uh, light blue nodes, including C, has a network distance of two to A. Because, for example, C need two steps or uh, two uh, network links in order to get to A. But if you consider how C can get to A in the network, there are actually multiple paths right, C can go through in order to get to A. But when we're counting the network distance, we're only counting the network distance of the shortest path. So how can C get to A by the shortest or minimum number of steps? So here in this case, C can get to A a minimum of two steps. And then again, orange nodes have a narrow distance of three to A. All the pink nodes have a narrow distance of four to A. And finally, F is furthest away from A with a narrow distance of five. All right. So once we have introduced this concept, we can introduce the next two measures of an uh, individual's importance in the network. This one is called between the centrality. So between the centrality captures the number of shortest paths between the pairs of nodes that pass through the focal node. And often used as a measure of gatekeeper or network broker. <clears throat> Let's say, for example, there are two groups of users on Twitter who don't directly talk to each other. But let's say you are the only person that connects these two group of users, right? So in this case, if one group wants to pass along some information to the other group, it has to go through you. <clears throat> so in this case, you function as the gatekeeper or the network broker between these two groups. So in this case, you will have a high between this centrality. We don't have enough time, so I won't go through all the mathematical details. But if you look at the, and I won't exactly give you time to count, but you, you probably just have to take my word for it. But here, if we look at this example, Liz has a between the centrality of 14. And why is that? Because for Alan to get to all the seven folks on the left, it has to go through Liz. So there's seven uh, shortest paths there. And same for Lisa. If Lisa wants to get to all the seven, focus, uh, seven folks on the left, it has to go through Liz. So seven plus seven give you a between the centrality of 14 for Liz. All right, so the next concept is called the closeness centrality. 
and uh, it captures the inverse of the sum of the network distance from the focal node to all others in the network. So basically, when you're closer to everyone else in the network, higher your close, closeness centrality will be. It's often used as a measure of one's ability to spread information to the whole network. For example, if you are a broadcaster, and I say if you have an influencer, have a like millions or millions of followers, then you have a very short network distance to everyone else, and you can quickly pass through some information to everyone else in the network. Then in that case, you have a high closeness centrality. Again, we don't have time to count, but here, and I've shown what is the network distance between everyone else to Emma. So if you sum all the network distance together and take the inverse of that, that gives you the closeness centrality of Emma, which is 1 over 14. Again, higher the closeness centrality means someone is more central or closer to everyone else in the network. And another concept is called eigenvector centrality. So eigenvector centrality is another measure to measure how important or influential someone else, someone is in the network. And they not only consider the degree centrality of the focal node, also consider the degree centrality of uh, the focal node's neighbors and so on through the network. And basically, again, the higher the eigenvector centrality means more central, more important, or more influential that someone is. And just to give you a real world example, if you ever wonder how, when you search something in Google, how Google ranks all those pages. So Google actually used an algorithm called PageRank, which is actually a variant of the eigenvector centrality. So basically for a website to rank on the top, not only itself has to be important, and all the, all the websites that made a reference to it has also to be important. So in this example, uh, let's say each circle or each node is a website. And the link from uh, one website to the other means this website has made a reference to the other website. And here the value or the size represents the eigenvector centrality for uh, each website. So B here obviously has the highest eigenvector centrality because a lot of websites have made reference to B. And, but interestingly, if we compare C, website C and website E. So if you look at website E, it has uh, many, uh, the degree centrality is high because many websites has made a reference to it. But because these websites are not that important, so E actually has a relatively low eigenvector centrality. So if you look at website C, on the other hand, well, C only have one website made a reference to it. But because his network neighbors or his friends is the most important uh, nodes or website in this whole network, and that's why C also has a relatively high eigenvector centrality. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how eigenvector centrality works. So it not only take accounts of one's own degree centrality, but also accounts for one's neighbor's degree centrality and so on through the network. All right, let's see what we're doing on time. Okay, so the last concept is called a triadic closure. So triadic closure calculates the proportion of connections among focal nodes neighbors and which are actually realized compared with the number of all possible connections. And uh, let's say uh, you take Liz, for example, all right? So Liz has three friends, right? Emma, Shane, and Alan. So there are three possible ties between Emma, Shane, and Alan, right? But only one of them exists. So one of, th one over th one of three, or one over three, give the Liz a local clustering coefficient of one over three, or one third. Because only one out of three possible ties exists. So local clustering coefficient, or try the closure, measures the extent to which one's neighbors are also connected. So the higher the value means stronger the click. It is often used as an indicator for the social cohesion or social support. So the higher the uh, triadic closure, or more once network neighbors also connect with each other, means higher social cohesion or social support for the focal. Group. Good. 
All right. Let me look at the chat. All right. Still seeing no questions, so I assume everyone is good. Um, all right, let me move on to the next section. All right, so let's see here. So previously we talked about the measures of individuals in the network, right? But sometimes we also care about the patterns and characteristics of the whole network in terms of its structure and connectivity. And obviously, obviously, this is another large area. So I only, only introduced four common ones, which is density, average pass lens, scale-free network, and subgroups. All right. So density captures the number of edges observed in the network relative to the number of all possible edges. So com uh, compare the two networks on the left here. So we have four nodes, A, B, C, D. In the first network, only three out of uh, six possible ties exist, which give you a density of 0.5. While in this network, all six possible ties exist, which give you a density of one. So density is always a number ranges from zero to one, with higher the number means more dense the tie is, or more possible ties there are. One note is that the density can be very misleading if we're comparing the network of different sizes. And if you look at the two networks on the right here, while the average degree or the average number of links per person is four in both networks, the density for the first network is actually much higher than density for the second network. And this is because with, as uh, the number of nodes in your network increases, the number of possible ties in your network actually increase uh, quadratically. So it's actually uh, very misleading if, to compare the network of different sizes for their densities. In those cases, we usually just compare their average degree, uh, average number of links per person. All right. So the next concept is called average pass lens or average distance. So it captures the average number of steps between two randomly chosen nodes in a network. And the longer the distance means it just takes more steps to get from, from one to the other, and uh, shorter means vice versa. Here, if we look at these two networks, and the network on the left has an average distance of 1.9, and as you can see, it's more socially cohesive and every, uh, there's no clear clusters. While the network on the right has an average distance of 2.4, means on average takes 2.4 steps to get from one to the other. And this network clearly has more distinct clusters and everyone's more further away from each other, or it's more separated. And in the real world, surprisingly, the social networks actually have lower pass lengths than we would think intuitively. So some of you might have heard Milgram's uh, experiment of a sixth degree of separation. But basically, in his experiment, he concludes that um, on average, it only takes six steps from one, uh, get to, from one to anyone else in the United States. And more recent evidence from Facebook, uh, which is a study is based on 1.6 billion users, which account for 22% of the world population, and shows that the, the average distance has actually decreased to 4.57, as in 2016. So on average, it only takes 4.57 steps to get from one to the other in the whole world. Yeah, which is pretty surprising. But again, that's just like a common property for the social networks. And another common property for social networks is the scale-free or power law distribution. And basically, a scale-free network says the degree distribution follows a power law. And in a power law distribution, let's say if you plot out the distribution of the number of connections that each one has in the network, then if it conforms to a power law, you will see most of us have very few network connections, but there are some of us has tons of network connections. And uh, this power law distribution applies to many real world phenomena such as wells, city population, earthquakes, and uh, it also applied to many uh, social media uh, phenomena. In one of the more recent example, 
people has uh, done that uh, in 2018. People have uh, looked at the following relation uh, network on Twitter, and they found out that the number of followers that each uh, or everyone has follow roughly follow a power law distribution. So the medium active user, okay, only has about 60 followers. However, there are some users have millions or millions of uh, tens of millions of followers. And if you plot out that distribution, you can see most nodes only have a low number of followers, but this distribution has a heavy tail, meaning some of us have millions or tens of millions of followers. Okay. And it is because of this unevenness in the distribution of connections in the social networks, a lot of times people have observed an interesting phenomenon called the friendship paradox. So basically friendship paradox says, on average, your friends have more friends than you do. And this phenomenon is first observed by sociologist Scott Feld in 1991, but have been proven true again and again in various settings. In one of the more recent examples in Facebook, people have studied 721 million users and there are 69 billion friendships on uh, Facebook. And they found out that the friendship paradox uh, is true for 93% of the users. So on average, user only have 190 friends, while their friends on average has 690 friends. So why this happens is because, uh, exactly because of this unevenness in the uh, distribution of the uh, degree distribution. Or in other words, some of us are more popular than other people. And because some people are more popular and have more friends, and uh, you're also more likely to be friends with these more popular friends. So these popular people have drive up the number of friends of your friends. So let's look at this simple example on the right, where we only have four people, okay? And the friendship paradox actually even held up in this very simple example. We don't have time to count, but if you really count, so on average, each girl only has two friends, but on average, each girl's friends has 2.25 friends. So friendship paradox hold here. So why is that the case is that if Becca is the most popular kids in this network and everyone's friend with Becca. So Becca actually drive up the number of friends that uh, everyone's friends has. So that's why the friendship paradox holds. All right, so the final slides on this section is that a lot of times in networks, we care about subgroups or communities. So nodes in real world networks often group themselves into smaller subgroups or communities for many reasons, such as alcohol chamber, confirmation bias, birds of feather flock together, et cetera. And social media, while well, reducing the communication costs across subgroups, in a lot of cases, they actually did not create more cohesive structure in many cases, especially around political campaign or political discussion. Here in the two examples on the right, so on, so on the uh, upper half, we have a political discussion around uh, during a uh, election in Philippines. You can clearly see there are clear clusters around each candidate. While the graph uh, on the bottom half shows the uh, block reference during the 2004 US election, where the blue are Democrats and the red are Republicans. And you can clearly see there are clear clusters and most connections are concentrated within uh, each party or political party. So in order to identify subgroups and communities, there are many community detection algorithms exist, and many are based on the concept called modularity. And it measures the strength of division of network into modules. So basically higher the modularity means more clear or stronger the evidence there is modules or communities or subgroups in your network. All right, let me look at the chat. We're still good here. Oh, let's see. Oh, I see one question here. 
Can network metrics like density and centrality be used to measure the flow of information in the network? Or is there a more effective way to measure the diffusion of knowledge between actors? Yes, yeah, so that, that is a great question. So um, density is usually measure, uh, only measures the dense uh, of the ties and it does not directly measure the direction of or the flow of the information. But you can probably say something like uh, if the network is more dense, the information you assume or is usually dense, uh, information um, flows more quickly. And uh, there are a lot of uh, centrality is actually based on the uh, idea of a uh, flow of information. So for some centrality measures, means higher the centrality means more able that someone is able to spread or receive information, uh, such as between the centrality or closeness centrality. And uh, Borgatti actually has a nice paper on this topic, talking about how different centrality measures and how uh, and how you can use that to measure the flow of information. I'm happy to uh, share that paper later if you're interested to learn more. But that's a great question. All right. See here, good, All right? Let me look at time. Yeah, we probably have to skip this section. But uh, like I said, social network analysis uh, also includes a set of theories and implications for the role of network positions, how they choose to interact with one another, as well as why people are influenced by their social networks. So we have theories on network positions. So where you are or what's your role in the network actually has a lot to do with how you behave, who you are, or what's your function. And we also have theories on how people choose each other and also have theories on why people or how people are influenced by other people in the network. And um, I'll probably just introduce two and then we'll probably need to skip the rest because we have a time constraint. And first is called structural equivalence. So two nodes are considered structural equivalent if they share the same network neighbors. And in this example, we can see two and five are structural equivalent and one four are structural equivalent because they have exact same uh, friends or they share the same network neighbors. And structural equivalent nodes are, are often use each other as a frame of reference. So as a result, they are often similar in other ways as well, such as attitudes, behavior, and performance. In one of the example uh, papers by Ron Bird shows that when physicians describing what drugs to pres prescribe, and physicians are actually more influenced by their structurally equivalent others rather than their close colleagues. In another example, uh, this is a famous theory in social network, which is called a social cohesion versus structural hope. So I have to introduce another concept called network constraint, such as uh, which represents the degree to which one's network neighbors are also connected. So let's say this is an organization network here, okay? And let's compare two people, Robert and James. And uh, James has a high network constraint because all his friends know each other. While Robert, on the other hand, has a low network constraint because all his friends don't know each other. So this actually has a lot of implications for the functions uh, or the network positions for Robert and James. For example, uh, James is, uh, has a high network constraint and that means he has less access to diverse information. So if something happens in groups A or C, James will probably be one of the last to know because he's so well embedded in group B. So he has less access to diverse information. But he has high social support or high trust or even high social norm because all his friends, all James' friends know each other. So they can all vouch for James and can all vouch for each other. So they can generate high social support, trust, and norm. And Robert, on the other hand, has low network constraint and because all his friends don't know each other. So that means Robert will have diverse information access. So if something happens outside in the system, Robert will probably be one of the first to know. 
But because his friends don't know each other, so they cannot vouch for Robert for each other. So Robert will have a low social support or trust or social norm. And you'll probably want to be in different network positions in different situations. For example, uh, James will probably more likely to be able to successfully borrow money from his friends than Robert, because James' friends can all vote for each other. But uh, studies have also shown that if you're uh, in a company setting, uh, people in Robert's position are more likely to get higher salaries or promote faster on the corporate ladders. So you want to be in different uh, positions in different situations. So I have to skip the rest uh, due to the time concern. But basically, social network theory is also considering how people select each other and how people influence each other. All right. And I uh, probably have to skip a part of the network visualization as well, because I do want to get to the real world examples, how we can use social network analysis to study M health and social media research. Um, but uh, network visualization is important because um, a good picture is better than a thousand of words, right? And when you plot or graph your networks, there's some general rules that everyone should know. For example, you don't want the edges to cross with each other and you want to draw links as straight as possible. You know, want your network to be uh, symmetric and you don't want a very long link in your network. You want to put the important or high degree nodes in the central. You want to distribute the nodes evenly. And you can use things like labels, thickness, or the shapes to represent the characteristic edges. You can do that the same thing for the nodes. But the bottom line is, uh, if you correctly using all these characteristics, you can convey a lot of information from the network graph. And one thing I want to mention is for large, when you plot a, or visualize a large network, as often you will do in social media data, because sometimes you have millions or millions of users. Sometimes cool looking visualizations are not always the most informative one. So this example of a food web uh, around a lake. So where each link represents one animal feeding on the other animal. You can plot the network at the most individual or micro level, where each node represents an animal. And here you have a very cool looking graph, right? But it doesn't really convey that much information. And uh, however, on the other hand, you can somehow consider aggregating your animal, for example, to a species and just using one node to represent each species. Then suddenly your graph is simplified a lot and clear uh, the relationship between different species is more clearly shown. So that's just something to keep in mind when you have a large network. There are different layout algorithms which consider how you can put nodes and links on map in a meaningful way. And uh, computer these days do that for you. So I'll just skip on this. One thing I do want to mention is when you have a longitudinal network, meaning you collect network information or network data over time. And there are usually two things you can do to visualize that network. First you, is that you can create a separate graph. For example, in this case, uh, they have collected the drug co-use network over four years. So they just uh, plot four separate networks, but they fix the node's location. So that's easy on the eyes over time. Uh, or you can consider doing an animation as uh, this one of the examples that I did. And here I show this is a topic called crane network, where each node represents a topic. And the link between two nodes representing have appeared in the same publication. So basically here we can look at the interdisciplinary of the whole science and how that events over time. So I have plotted that for 20 years. And the one observation is that over time, this whole scientific field does not become more interdisciplinary over time. However, there are some more interdisciplinary topics that emerging over time, such as uh, neuroscience. So you look at neuroscience over time, it's connected with many topics with, from uh, other fields, such as behavioral science, health, uh, biological topics, and engineering. So again, the point is animation can be one of the powerful tools to visualize longitudinal networks. All right, 
sorry for jumping and skipping everything through because we only have 10 more minutes. So let me look at the chat. Oh, OK, no questions. I assume we're good. So for the last 10 minutes, I want to cover some real world examples of how we can use or how people have actually used SNA uh, in social media and M health research. And uh, I give four examples. Let's see if I can cover them all. So in the first example, this is a, a probably more famous example you've probably heard of. So this was Santola Publishing Science in 2010, where he considers the spread of health behavior. So the basic question is, how do social networks affect the spread of behavior online? So a common hypothesis is that the networks with many cluster ties and a high degree of separation would be less effective for behavior diffusion. So if you compare the two networks on the bottom, on the left, we have a network which has high clustering, high separation, and long network distance between each individual. So each individual is only connected to his neighbors or his or her neighbors on the right or left. Or the network on the right has low clustering, low separation, and relative short network distance. It's just more random. <clears throat> so the conventional thought is if we want to spread a virus or a behavior on the network, it actually will spread much faster or deeper on the network on the right. But the competing hypothesis is that uh, the network with more clustering may be more advantageous. A spread of complex behavior needs social reinforcement. So this says that if you are talking about a more complex social behavior, such as adopting a health behavior or adopting an app, it might need more social reinforcement from your friends. So if you just see one of your friends do it, you might not consider it. If you see two of your friends do it, you might start considering. But as you see more and more of your friends doing something, then you're also more likely to do something. So it really needs that uh, social reinforcement component there. And if that's the case, the network on the left is actually more advantageous in terms of spreading behavior. So Santella actually, uh, actually go ahead and do, have conducted this experiment. So he constructed different online community. So he constructed two community or two networks and he randomized people into one of these two networks. And the behavior he interested in is a uh, health behavior, which is register for a health forum website. So every time our participant adopted the behavior, meaning register for the health forum, then the message will be sent to his or her health buddies inviting them to adopt. So he initialized one, the black nodes to adopt the health, uh, to adopt or register for the health forum. Then messages will send out to his or her friends, which is uh, indicated by the red notes, and inviting them to uh, register for the forum as well. And then he want to see uh, how do the behavior spread in these two different networks, and uh, do does it spread faster and deeper on the network on the left or right? So he conducted the network multiple times, but the bottom line or the <coughs> conclusion is. Uh, the, this behavior actually spread much faster and deeper for on the network on the left, where we have much uh, more clustering and separation. So this means that the individual adoption of complex behavior, such as registering for a health website, was much more likely when there's social reinforcement from multiple neighbors in the social network. All right. Yeah, I'll probably skip this one since we only have five minutes left. Yeah. So another study considered tweeting from left to right is online political communication more than an echo chamber. So the basic question is, do people only communicate with those with the same political ideology on social media? There are two possible hypotheses. And the first is yes, because of echo chamber. That means people only expose themselves to information that simply reinforce their existing views as a result of their selective exposure and ideology separation. And the alternative hypothesis is, is no. So online communication is more than an echo chamber and people are more open online and are more likely to expose to information from both sides. So Barbara et al. Actually in 2015 actually conducted this study on Twitter 
and to see which hypothesis holds. So first, they uh, use the following network on Twitter of 3.8 million active Twitter users in the United States and derive their political ideology. And basically, if you, all the accounts you follow is a liberal accounts, then you are probably more of a liberal person. And if all of the accounts you follow is a conservative accounts, then you are more of a conservative, conservative person. Then they obtain Twitter conversation about 12 significant topics. Some of them are political, some of them are non-political, and during 2012 to 2014. And let's see what is the discussion network for each of this uh, event. And what they found out is that uh, for the, uh, and as you can see here, for all the political events, such as election, government shutdown, there is a high degree of ideology polarization, meaning people only talk to others with the same political ideology. But for non-political events, such as Oscar, Super Bowl, people are more likely to engage in cross-political ideology conversations. So here, the first uh, example, I believe, let's see here, shows the, the 2012 uh, election, the figure A. As you can see, there are clear clusters in the discussion network. Well, most discussions are within each political ideology. Well, graph B shows the discussion around Super Bowl. You can see it's more, much more class, uh, much more uh, sp sporadic or random. There's no clear clusters around political ideology. And the further did more statistical analysis on this, and they found out that the information was uh, so for political issues, information was exchanged primarily among individuals with the with the uh, same ideology preferences. However. Across all cases, liberals were more likely than conservatives to engage in cross-ideological uh, dissemination. All right. I also have a one-off study on my own, uh, but since we only have two minutes, uh, I won't get to this. So let me just skip that. But um, first off, uh, that's it for this uh, workshop. Thank you for listening. And if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to me. And uh, also, if you're a UConn student, it might be interesting to learning more about social network analysis and system science. I'm actually offering a course uh, in the next fall more on this topic. So feel free to reach out to me if you're interested. All right, thanks for listening. Uh, let me open the chat. So there's a question here. I can answer one question. So when studying the effect of clustering on diffusion, did they need to adjust for the effects of other centrality or characteristics as potential confounders? Yes, so that is a great question. So depending on what levels you're studying. So if you're uh, studying uh, the diffusion at the individual level, meaning when or how much information an individual get, then yes, you need to control for the centrality matters because the where that person is in the network is probably matters, right? But if you're just studying the diffusion on the whole network measure, you probably won't, uh, don't need to uh, account for centrality on the individual level, but you probably need to account um, for some confounders on the macro level, such as the density of the network. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, I think we're right on time. Stop sharing. All right, thanks everyone for listening. Again, if you have questions, just feel free to reach out to me, all right?